Jeremiah 18, we'll just hit chapter 18 tonight. <clears throat> the theme of tonight's message is the sovereignty of God, and I'll define that in a minute. It was William Booth who said, The greatness of the, of the man's power is the measure of his surrender. The greatness of the man's power is the measure of his surrender. His surrender. That man's surrender. Surrender to who? Well, it's obvious, right? Surrender to God. And, and so the greater the man will reveal that he surrenders greater than any other man. <clears throat> William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army, if you knew that or not. He was also quoted in saying that uh, every person uh, should be uh, hung on a string and dangled over fire for a while so that they get a taste of what hell is like so that it will change their, their life. <clears throat> we see this type of uh, person throughout history, uh, starting, of course, with Jesus Christ when he said, I do everything that the Father asked me to do. That, now, that's total surrender, isn't it? Uh, when God asks you to do something, that you, you do it because you're surrendered to him. And you're surrendered to him because you trust in him. And, and the disciples caught that. And so they were totally surrendered to the Lord and the will of the Lord, even though it was going to be a task that was going to be difficult for them and life-threatening. And in fact, it did cost them their life. But they were totally surrendered with it. They were willing to give up their lives for it. And throughout history, we see that. Uh, throughout history, some of the greatest evangelists through our times uh, were totally surrendered to the Lord. Martin Luther was totally surrendered to the Lord when he put that thesis on the Catholic Church. Totally surrendered to the Lord. Chuck Smith was totally surrendered to the Lord. And these men have done great things because they were totally surrendered to the Lord. They believed one thing, and they all have something in common, is that God is in control, that he is a sovereign God. The word sovereignty, if you were to look it up, you'd probably find uh, definitions like um, superior, greatness, supreme in power, authority, ruler, independent uh, of all others. And that would kind of describe what this person is, as being sovereign. But to put it very simply and biblically, it's God in control. God in control. He is sovereign in that he is in total control of everything. Now, can we say that for sure? Can we look back at the garden situation and say, was God in control of that whole situation? He created man and Eve. Did, did he realize that they would fall? Well, of course he did. If God is eternal and he's not bound by time, then God knows past, present, and he knows future. So God can see what the future holds. He already knows what our future is. Some suggest that that's why he chose us, because he knew that we would make a choice for him in our free will. And so if he sees future, then he saw Adam and Eve, and so he provided for their fall already. That tells us that he is in control of those situations. You look at the life of Israel. You look at the life of Israel and you see the sovereign work of God through their life. All the way from, from, the, from the very beginning, but from Abraham. God chose this person, Abraham, to bring about a great people. So that these people would reflect who he was in his grace and his mercies and so forth. And in his um, righteousness and his sovereignty. And so the people reflect that of God. The other nations would see Israel, they would see God in Israel. And that's why you have someone like Rahab in the city of Jericho, and, and she would say something to the effect of, I've heard about your God, and so you know we know who your God is, and he's able to do pretty great things, and so we fear him, because they saw God in the children of Israel. And yet, when you see the children of Israel, they make bad choices. The, the kingdom was divided. And then the kingdom was conquered by the Babylonians. But yet God was always working, right? Throughout their lives, he was always working. Just as he works through our life. Seventy years in captivity to the Babylonians. They spent 70 years in bondage. Seventy wasted years because they were indulging themselves in idolatry and in sin and in the culture. 
And so they were in bondage. And God put them there. He brought the Babylonian Empire and he, in a sense, you know, pulled them by their ears to come and to take Israel and bring them back into captivity. And then he comes and he destroys the Babylonian Empire and then he brings Israel right back to Jerusalem, still working with them. You would think they'd learn by, their, by that time their lesson that God would want to teach them that he is in total control. And they did to a certain degree. And so then hundreds of years later, Jesus Christ enters into the picture. Again, God's perfect timing. Not only is it perfect, it's prophetic. Because Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies just in his birth and his coming to the world on the exact time frame that God had set. And so Jesus enters the world, and what does the Jewish people do? They reject him. They reject him, and so God has to still work with them. And to this day, the Jewish nation, Israel, still has not humble themselves before their God. So has God been working with Israel? Sure. Has God completed his work with Israel? No. Is God going to complete his work with Israel? Yes. When will that happen? At the tribulation period. So now we're talking thousands of years that God is working with Israel and yet he hasn't finished yet. He hasn't finished yet. Yet God is sovereign in all of that work throughout the lifespan of Israel. When you think about it, you, you have to ask yourself, okay, Lord, when does someone learn their lesson? Uh, when do we realize that you're in control? Uh, when do we finally humble ourselves and finally surrender so that you can do the work that you want to do in our life? You know, is it going to take all the way to the tribulation period or the, when the rapture comes? Really, that's the question that we need to ask ourselves today. And so here we, we have Jeremiah uh, in a sense, uh, being told by the Lord concerning his sovereignty that he is in total control. And so he leads them to a potter's house. A potter's house. Look at verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. In other words, I will give you my message. My message to my children. Evidently, making pottery was a good, profitable business back then. Uh, we know that through archaeologists who have found numerous pots and uh, throughout various periods of the children of Israel and so forth. So very lucrative, and, and it makes sense because they did most of their cooking in, in pots, and they had their bowls and then all the utensils and various things like that. So it was something that, that Israel was very familiar with. They knew what he was talking about when they said the potter's house. They actually had a house, and you would go to this house, and the person would make your tup your Tupperware in a sense you know you would put in your order and say I need some dishes I need some pots I need some boiling pots I need some small pots you know I need some cups and and so forth and you place your order and then your order would come in and you take your your clay bowls and and so forth you know after they they put them uh in in the oven and baked them and so forth when Virginia and I were dating yeah we were dating at the time I think we already had Modesto, and I had started uh, another job. I had like three jobs. I worked for her dad. I worked for a screen place, a screen where you put the the uh, screens on windows. You make those window screens so that the flies can't get in if you open up the windows. I did that for a while. And then I also worked for a friend of mine that's father owned a, a pottery manufacturing company. Now, this was a more of a up-to-date kind of manufacturing kind of company. It's where they had molds. It wasn't the old turn the wheel and you spin into a pot or so forth. This was actually molds. And so I learned how to mix the mud. I learned how to pour them in the molds and to wait so long so that the outer part dries first. And then you pour the rest of it out and it leaves the outer part and you let it dry and you you know, take the top off and you cut it and, and then let it dry and then eventually the pot just falls out and then you take the pot and you dip it into a, a color and you might even take a sponge and wipe a little bit of that color on top then you put it in the oven and boom, out comes a, a nice beautiful pottery. And so I did that for quite a while and, and then we decided that we were going to sell this on Sundays um, 
at the swap meets. And so we did a little business and they actually sold the, the pottery. So it's a neat little uh, system that we have today. And I'm sure it's even more technical than, than even that. But back then it was literally on a um, wheel in a sense. It says in verse three, and they went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel. Literally two stones. Uh, one stone was was uh, disc shape and one was smaller than the other. And they, uh, you turn the one, it would turn the other and you put your clay on there and you start making your, your pot. Uh, some, something like in school. I don't know if they still do that today in school. Virginia and I were in a, uh, I think it was a pottery class or might have been an art class. And we actually did the wheel thing where you had to actually kick it, you know, and it turned it and you put the clay on there. I just could not do it just couldn't get it my I would put my thumb in there and by the time I was finished it was leaning over to the side no matter no matter what I did no matter how much I tried it just couldn't couldn't do it and we were going to get graded on it so eventually what I did I just threw a big lump of clay on there and just put my hands on it and I made this mountain that's the best I could do then after I made the mountain I, I just put poked my fingers in it and then I made a little tongue and it was a little monster with big eyes and a tongue sticking out I actually got a, a good grade on it too but I just couldn't do the, the, the pots at all. Virginia, I think, did. You know, could spin it and then cut it and, and, and so forth, but just, just couldn't do that. And so Jeremiah is going down to the potter's house. He's, he's watching these guys do the pottery and so forth. And it says in verse 4, the vessels that he made of clay were marred. Now, marred is talking about being spoiled, <laughs> kind of like I did. I spoiled it. And, and literally... The tense here suggests that it was a repeated action, kind of like what I did. <laughs> no matter what I did, it just kept going over the side or, or all of a sudden became an oval shape or one wall was too thin and, you know, it would break and, and I, just, I just couldn't get it. And so in a sense, this guy just was struggling and every time he made it, it was marred, it was marred, it was marred. But it was in the hands of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. Now these guys were so good, you know, and you get so good, that you can actually just take a marred pot and you just do a couple of things to it and boom, you create a you know, masterpiece in a sense. Um, I tried doing mason work at my house. I had a neighbor that actually taught it in the prison over here in Chino. And so I asked him, hey, show me how to do it. You know, we did his whole house and he showed me how to do it. And so then he was helping me do my house. And so I kind of got the hang of it. Well, I came to the pilasters. And as I was doing the pilasters, ran my string and so forth. All of a sudden, one of the pilasters, the pulse, was starting to lean like this. You know, just starting to go like this. And I'm looking, I'm like, that's not right. So I'm like, I could not get it to go straight. So I went over there and said, hey, I can't get this go straight. He grabs his trowel and he goes, boom, 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 and it was straight, just like that, with, with no problems whatsoever. I mean, how did you do that? You know, it just takes time. You know, it, it takes experience. It, it takes working with it all the time. And that's the way this guy was. You, you, you have a mark clay. Oops, made a mistake. Psh, I turned it into something else, just like that. At his discretion, right? At his discretion, now, in the next verses, the Lord interprets the meaning of the potter and the clay here. And then he gives Jeremiah in verses 5 through 12 the message of this. So you get this picture of a potter's house, and he's making his pottery. He, he's creating his masterpieces. They don't all come out, but he turns them into something nice at his discretion because he is the potter. He's the master. He's the one that's doing the work. We had... Uh, I, I can't remember the, the name of it, the Michael who came out and he was uh, the potter's field or something like that. And he came out and um, he actually uh, turned this whole room into a a pottery place. We we put sheets all over the place and he had his, his um, I think he had his, his bench out there and put the clay on there. And he, man, he made a beautiful uh, clay pot and everything and then also he crushed it and it, again signifying how the potter's in control and how God does that with us at times and that's going to be the message here it says then the word of the Lord came to me saying that is Jeremiah O house of Israel can I not do with you as this potter 
Now, that's a question. And it is a rhetorical question that he is asking to Israel. You see this potter and how the clay is marred and how he will take that marred clay and then turn it into something else. And God says, can I do that to you? That's the question. And the answer would be no for many of us, right? No, you can't do that to me. I don't like what you're doing right now to me. I'm not enjoying what I'm going through right now. I'm not enjoying my stress. I'm not enjoying the frustration. I'm not enjoying, you know, what it is that I'm going through. And so, no, you can't do that. But really the answer should be what? Yes, God has that right. He created us. There's a scripture in in Romans, I believe, that Paul uses, and he says, who are you, the creation, to tell the creator, why have you made me like this? Again, speaking of his sovereignty, that God's in control. That scripture has helped me out a lot. He says, can I not do with you as a potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hands, O house of Israel. So just like that potter, grabs that clay and he takes his hands and he molds it into what he wants to make it in. The clay doesn't tell him how you should mold me. The clay doesn't uh, reject him. He just allows him to mold him into that. And of course, the Lord has absolute power over the clay to do what he wants to do with it and will achieve his purpose regardless of how often he has to rework that clay oftentimes tell people learn your lesson now and I like learning my lesson now because if we don't learn it now God will put us through some things until we learn it you know it just seems like God takes us around until we learn it until we learn it until we learn it you know it's like you can take drugs so many times and finally say you know I'm just tired of it and and I keep trying to get off of it I'm I'm trying to stop drinking and I I fall off the wagon I get back on it but there's a point where where all of a sudden you do whatever it needs to be done in order for you to finally stop because you're so fed up with it and that's where we need to get where we let God start to do the work in our lives so in verse 7 he says the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up to pull down and to destroy it if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil or its evil doings what the intention is there I will relent or I will change my mind in bringing that disaster that I thought to bring upon it. Now that actually is a positive message, right? That's the same type of message that a parent has to a child. Look, if you just stop that behavior, then you will be blessed. If you just stop doing those things, then you won't have punishment anymore. You know, that's a positive thing, trying to correct you, trying to get you to stop doing what you're doing because what you're doing is destructive. And so that's what God is saying here to the children of Israel. If you just stop doing this evil thing, then I will change my mind and I will begin to bless you. And the instant I speak concerning the nation and concerning the kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight, and it's... This word is a little different in in that it's not doing evil, but that uh, what God considers to be evil. What he says is evil. He sets the rules. I was was watching um, a part of the movie, uh, and I always get the name of Mizrael, the old one with uh, Leon who plays uh, the thief and then becomes the governor of the, uh, of the little city there, you know, and the man's chasing him because he was in prison. He founds out that, that he was a prisoner and now he's a governor. I don't know if you've... La Miserial, you've never seen that movie? Oh boy, you've got to watch that movie. And, and it's just such a, such a neat movie about the law and grace. And I caught the part where, where it was at the very end. This police officer was chasing him and he, he prided himself on always always following the law the law if you have no law you have no order if you have no order you have chaos and so we must have laws 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 leon 
is an example of grace, or, or I can't remember the guy's name. He's an example of grace and how God has grace on this person. He was hungry, so he stole bread. And because he stole the bread, he broke the law. The law imprisoned him. He went to jail for being hungry. Well, they finally let him out. He spent his time. He got out. He actually went to a home because it was cold. He had no place to go. And while he's in his home, it turned out to be a a church. Well, then he stole candlesticks, silver candlesticks, and some other stuff. And then he walked out. Well, they caught him. And he told them that the guy gave him these items to live on. And so they took him back to the house. And the man looked at him. And he says, yes, we gave them to him. And he kind of pushed him to the side and says, do good with this opportunity. Do good with this opportunity. In other words, you have had grace. So do something good with that grace. And so he went on to change his life and to live it to help others. He took all that resource and he you know, uh, used it to help others. And at the end of the movie, the law still was after him because the law knew he was a criminal. And he can't, a criminal can't be a governor. A criminal can't, you know, have that much money. There's something wrong. So, so in the very end, uh, after uh, <clears throat> Leon had an opportunity to kill him, Leon had an opportunity to, to, to um, you know, destroy him and so forth, but he never took those opportunities. And at the end of the movie, here's the law, and then here's grace. And the law says, look, I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you your freedom. Now, how was he going to give him his freedom? The law had to die. So he actually put the handcuffs on himself and he threw himself in the river and drowned. So the law, in a sentence, has to be crucified in our lives. We're no longer under the law. We're under grace. And in grace, we have freedom. We have freedom to live, freedom to express. See, and if we take grace and not do what is evil, what God considers to be evil, then we have freedom in this life to enjoy the things of God but it's what he says it's what he says is evil or what is not evil so that he so that it does not obey my voice then I will relent concerning the good that which I have said I would benefit again now this is a negative message right it's a negative message here so if he doesn't if it does evil in my sight then this is what's going to happen That's the old, what do they call it, Uh, rule. You know, a man will reap what he sows or there are consequences for your actions. You ever hear that one? Cause and effect, those things. You know, I remember trying to teach Charles that there are effects for what you do. Well, that's not fair. Well, it doesn't matter whether you think it's fair or not. There's still, you know, going to be effects for what you do. If you do wrong, then you need to be punished. Well, that's not right. And I don't care if you think it's right. It's just the way it is. And we have to understand that. Uh, This is the whole problem with the Ferguson thing, with the Brown issue. It's all about doing what's right. And if you do what's wrong, you will be punished. You will be caught, right? I mean, that's the whole push of this whole thing. Here's a young man who was in a store, just ripped it off. And then he's confronted with a police officer. And the police officer just says, hey, what's going on? Get out of the street. Just go to the side. And the guy says, what are you going to do about it? It's all about rebelliousness. The Bible talks about that in youth. That is bound up within the heart of the youth. And and if you have that type of attitude, then boom, you're going to have the effect and we saw the effect. This young man had to, had to die. Now, I'm not just saying this, but you're, you're talking about African Americans and well-respected African Americans coming out and saying, look, if an officer tells you to get off the street, get off the street. If he pulls you over in the car, don't have drugs in the car with you. Don't have guns with you. It's very simple. Um, some very well-respected uh, political persons who live in affluent neighborhoods basically tell their kids the same thing. Look, they pull me over all the time, but they've never given me a ticket. 
They've, they've never hurt me. They've all respected me because I don't have drugs. I don't have guns. And, and when they pull me over, I roll the window down. I have my hands up on the steering wheel and I give them what they want and then they let me go. And I have police officers that are friends, you know. So the cause and effect thing, again, the cause and effect. If you're obedient to your parents, if you're obedient to God, if you do what's right, then God will bless you. But if you do evil in his sight, and it's what he considers to be evil, then he says, no, all bets are off. Concerning good, you won't have it. And that is a rule and principle that we need to live by. And it's not just teenagers, it's all of us. We all have to be obedient to the Lord if we want to be blessed. Now, verse 11, he goes on and says, Now, therefore, speak to the men, or really the people in the Hebrew of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devastating or devising a plan against you. Now, literally, God is saying here, and he's using the same phrase as as back in the earlier verses of a potter. And he's saying here, I am literally shaping a disaster and devising a plan against you. So like the potter who creates that masterpiece, I am creating a great disaster for you because you are doing evil. And the consequences will be devastation. But he says this, return now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. So there's always a way out. There's always an opportunity that God gives us. When he presents us with that opportunity, we need to repent. And that word repent literally means to turn the other direction. We need to understand that word repent. It doesn't mean saying, oh, I'm sorry. But you're sorry because you got caught. You're not sorry because you did the wrong thing. There's a big difference there. When you are convicted of your sins by the Lord, you're sorry because you know that it has hurt God and it hurts you that you would hurt him that's repentance it's not oh I got busted and you want to hear I'm sorry it means going back and making everything right what you did wrong and it's making that effort to live right So God gives us that opportunity when he reveals to us that we've done wrong to simply repent, to stop it and start doing what's right. And they said, that is helpless, verse 12. So we will walk according to our own plans and we will everyone obey the dictates of his evil heart. There's that phrase again. Now, when, he's, when the people say that is helpless, what they're saying there is, is, Jeremiah, look, you need to stop talking to us because that is hopeless. <laughs> We're not going to listen to you. And so you're wasting your time talking to me. That's how people get when they're rebellious. You're wasting your time. And in my head, I'm going, la, 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 <laughs> You know, they're not even listening because they really don't care. They really don't care about you. They don't care about the truth. They don't care about what is right. All they care about is what they want to do. To follow the dictates of their own evil heart. My question is, why? You ever ask yourself, why? Sometimes we look on the superficial or on the surface, I'm sorry, on the surface of, uh, of, of this, of people, as to they did wrong, and, and they're wrong, and, and they shouldn't be doing that. But you ever ask yourself, why? Why would they do this? What, what happened? Well, we know that we have an enemy, and I'm not blaming him and you know, doing this, let's blame the devil thing. But we have an enemy that hates us. And he will do whatever it takes to destroy us. He will bless us. He will 
bring pride into our life. He will allow riches and pleasure. And, you know, he will do whatever it takes to get you to destroy yourself. Because that's his whole plan. Is to destroy the creation of God. Because he hates God that much. And so we have an enemy out there that's that roaring lion. And he's seeking for someone to devour And when we begin to get rebellious and don't want to listen, don't want to hear truth, don't want to obey God, the enemy's nearby and he's just laughing. If you can picture it, he's standing there going, boy, this is great. (laughs) They bought it. (laughs) They think that they're right And they probably might be, but they're not listening. They're not paying attention. They don't care. This is exactly where I want him because then I will destroy him. I will crush him and God can't do a thing about it. And I've got him right in my hand. Why? Why do we do that? Why do we give in to the enemy and not to the Lord and to things of God? And there's a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons we've been hurt. We've gone through some horrific things um, in the past. Struggles, letdowns, lies. And I mean, the list can go on and on and on and so forth. (laughs) You know, just so many different things that can affect a society, our jobs, the way people treat us. And, and all of these things can sometimes have a negative effect on us and how we respond. Uh, there's a point where you can even tell yourself, it's hopeless. Stop talking to me. I don't care. I just don't care. And that's a sad place to be because you should care. You should care. And as a child of God and having a relationship with Jesus Christ, we should care about what is truth and what is right. You know, the beautiful video that we showed all pointed toward Jesus Christ and the birth of Christ. But at the very end, boom, how many people will call the Mormon church and be trapped in that lie? I remember... And I've shared this before because it's just so true. Uh, Knowing this family that had gone to the Calvary before that we used to go to uh, for quite a few years. And then then all of a sudden they just weren't found. And I was at a yard sale and there they were. And so we just started talking again. And I said, hey, where are you guys fellowshipping now? And they go, oh, right here on Bain Street in in the Mormon church. And I'm just like, what? And it just blew me away. And I said to them, I go, are you kidding me? Why would you do that? Oh, they're just so family. You know, they got everything that's needed there. They're so loving. They're so caring and, you know, and so forth. And I thought, wow, they bought the lie. They sold their souls for family instead of truth. Instead of truth. I'd rather have truth than family. And that's what Jesus says. I've come to bring a sword. I've come to bring a sword. Virginia and I almost got sucked into that. We met some people right before I got saved. Right before, wonderful people, friendly people, family people. I was playing basketball at the Mormon church. We were involved in in their parties in Christmas time. Jesus, the whole thing, very, very much like our Catholic religion. And we got suckered into it. They came over to birthday parties. I don't know if even the kids even can remember the Breeses. You know, the kids played with them and everything. And then all of a sudden I get saved. And of course, I'm listening to Walter Martin, the Bible answer man, one of the greatest... Uh, apologetics in the world that I, at least that I think of just boom always answering questions on things on the radio just boom 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 just really quick and you get all these information from him and talk he would have like the Friday uh, the Friday cult day so he would pick a cult and he would just exhaust it Mormonism Jehovah Witnesses so immediately I started asking them questions and eventually it got to the point where you know you guys are a cult (laughs) you know we don't want anything to do with that it's a lie it's a lie I'd rather have the truth than a lie than a lie it's hopeless it's hopeless we tell ourselves don't don't why because something's happened in our lives we're not willing to hear the truth I hope that you'll deal with that. 
you need to know that God loves you and that he cares about you. And if there's rebelliousness in your heart towards him, you need to get rid of that. You need to be obedient to what he considers to be truth and not fall into the hands of the enemy. He tells him to return to the Lord. Then he goes into the truth that what has happened is Israel has forgotten the Lord. Verse 13, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Ask now among the Gentiles, Who has heard such a thing? The virgin of Israel has, got, has done a very horrible thing. Now, <clears throat> he's asking another question in, in a sense here. H have you even heard this? And he's speaking to the Gentiles, among the Gentiles, have you even heard this? In other words, their sin is so bad that even the Gentiles haven't heard this. That's how bad it is. Will a man leave the snow water of Lebanon, which comes from the rock of the fields? Will the cold flowing waters be forsaken for strange waters? Now, this is another rhetorical question. Would you leave clean, fresh, rocky mountain waters for the sewers down here in the lowlands? No. <laughs> who, would, who would do that? Rhetorical question. Verse 15, another rhetorical question. Because my people have forgotten me or they have rejected me or have come to a point where they believe I don't exist. You know, there's stages to that. <clears throat> you can believe that there's a God, and that Jesus Christ is a God. And I've seen this throughout the 20 years of in ministry, where people can get very gung-ho for God. And they lose sight of the purpose of God. And when they lose sight of that, then they forget God then they don't believe there is a God because God hasn't answered their prayers. Can I tell you this? God isn't here to give you everything you want. God is here to prepare you for eternity. That's God's purpose. He has opened up the doors for eternity for us. He has given us a way to heaven. Uh, this life on this earth is not everlasting everlasting it, it, it's only for a short time 80 we're only promised 70 years a maybe 80 85 years but then that's it then what are you going to do that's our whole perspective that is where our focus needs to be on what's going to happen when i'm 80 and 85 and i die at that moment what will happen to me will i go to heaven or will i go to hell now we don't have that perspective all the time especially when we're younger. Oh yeah, I'll accept Christ. I'm going to heaven now. Wonderful. Now let me just live my life. No, we need to live our life for eternity. We need to stay focused on the goal and that is to get to heaven. And while we're on earth, working our way in getting there. But we lose sight of that because we go through things and trials and so forth because God is working in us. He's molding us. He's shaping us like that potter. And he wants to remove a lot of the garbage a lot of the pain that you've gone through, whatever abuse you've gone through, he wants it all out of you. He wants it forgiven. He wants it in the past. And he wants you to look forward to the future with blessings and hope. And so he works in you. And as soon as we pray and, and he doesn't give us what we think we should have, we go, well, where is he then? Why isn't he working with me? Why hasn't he answered me? Why hasn't he given me what I wanted? Well, he's not there. And if he's not there, why am I praying? So you stop praying. And if I stop praying, then why am I reading? So you stop reading. If you stop reading, well, why am I going to church? You stop going to church. You know what? There is no God. And you lose sight of everything. But what you've really lost is eternal life. That should always be our focus. When I first got saved, I was very worried that I would lose sight of that because I lose sight of a lot of things. I start off very excited about things and then I lose sight of why I was doing it and then I end up just throwing it by the wayside. 
That was my MO in a sense. And so when I became a Christian, I thought, Lord, am I going to lose sight of what you have done? I don't want to lose sight. So please help me to always believe in you no matter what happens until I'm 99 years old. Now, hopefully that wasn't prophetic because I don't want to live that long. (laughs) (laughs) But I would say that, you know, as long as I live was my intent, but I don't want to live 99, maybe 60. (laughs) But, you know, just... Just, Lord, keep me focused on you. And that was a prayer. And I think God has heard that prayer and he's answered that prayer because he's kept me focused on him. There are plenty of times I didn't want to stay focused and I would have given up in a heartbeat you know, and so forth, but I didn't. And it's because we have to keep sight of that and not get to the point where we've forgotten that he even exists. They have buried incense to worthless idols, They have caused themselves to stumble in their ways from the ancient past to walk in pathways and not on a highway. Now what he's talking about there is the ancient ways. It is the ways that God has shown Israel to walk and what he deems to be truth. They've forgotten those ways and they have walked in new ways and new paths. In other words, they're following the Canaanite goddess. And the idolatry. For us today, it would be that God has established in his word in the New Testament how we ought to live. And yet we've chosen not to live that way. We've chosen another path. And this path is either our own path or someone else's path that we like as our own path. But ultimately it comes back to worshiping our own image as God because it's what we want to do. To make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and shake his head. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of calamity. What he means is I'm going to turn my back on them and I will refuse to help them in that day. And he's, again, he's talking about Babylon. And when that will happen, <clears throat> and God will wipe out the temple and so forth. So now, <laughs> saying that to the children of Israel, there's a plot against Jeremiah as the minister of the truth. Verse 18, then they said, come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priests, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet, come and let us attack him with the tongue and let us not give heed to any of his words. Wow. So let's plot against Jeremiah here. Let's plot against him. How can we trap him? Uh, He's threatening our livelihood. We are priests, we are prophets, we are counselors. He's threatening us. So what are we going to do? How are we going to trap him? What lies will we use against him? And when we use this against him, let's not believe a word that he says. Does that sound familiar to you? Like someone else had gone through that later on down the road? I mean, it sounds very familiar. You know, Jesus Christ, basically they did the same thing with him, didn't they? The religious leaders, they felt threatened. He's claiming to be the Messiah, the King. I mean, this this is our job, not his job. You know, okay, let's get together and let's counsel. Let's, let's seek some wisdom here from one another and let's trap this guy. Let's use our tongues. Let's use our wits. Okay, if you're the Christ, then who's, you know, coin? Who's this money? Should we pay our taxes to Caesar or should we not pay our taxes? And they tried to trap him that way. Of course, you couldn't trap. How you trap God? You know, you, the one who created language, you know, how do you, how do you trap him? Well, whose, fig, whose face is on the coin? Well, Caesar's. And then give to Caesar's with Caesar's. And give to God what is God. What Jesus was saying was, let Caesar have his money, but you're God's creation. So give your heart to God, is what he's saying. They couldn't trap him. But They tried. Then Jesus said to his disciples in John fifteen twenty, remember the words that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. 
If they keep my word, they will keep yours also. And Jesus was warning his disciples, look, if they had done it to Jeremiah and they have done it to me, guess what? (laughs) They will do it to you. They will do it to you. We were at a meeting yesterday at Dave Rosales and about 12 pastors or so. It was a very good meeting. Um, I learned so much uh, from that meeting and the wisdom that's there among all these guys. Uh, That's my accountability right there, you know, and what I do here. And there was um, one pastor that had had been asking some some difficult questions because he's going through difficult times in his his church, where there are he's a younger guy, probably in his early thirties, and uh, he was talking about these older men coming in, and they're more like fifty years old and so forth. And he says these guys are coming in, and he just doesn't know how to handle them because they're coming in and they think they know everything. And so they're coming in. Who does the finances? Who's your elders? Who's your deacons? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why, why are you here? What is going on? And they just have all these questions and accusations and, and so forth. And so Dave just you know, gave some, some great wisdom there you know, on how to handle that. And one of the things he said was, hey, all of us are sitting here. And we all have similar stories, don't we? And everybody was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Every one of us have a story just like that. If it happened to Jeremiah and it happened to Jesus, it will happen to us. There's no doubt about it. So what we do is, and Dave has this philosophy, there are gorillas and there are monkeys. I handle the gorillas. I get my leadership to handle the monkeys. You know, in a sense, you know, so the little things you have leadership, handle them. The gorillas you've got to handle, you know, in a sense. So he was basically giving the, the wisdom of let your leadership handle it. Seems like you got them involved in it and let them take care of it. And if it gets to a point that they can't, then you got to get in there before it becomes that big gorilla, you know, and stop it. And he even gave counsel of if it comes to that point, you kick them out. Because you cannot allow them to divide the body of Christ. He was very adamant on that issue. And that's really the whole purpose, right? Of the enemy to divide and to conquer and to kill. They wanted to kill Jeremiah. They didn't like the message that he had. They wanted to kill Jesus. They didn't like the message that he had. They wanted to kill the disciples. And they did kill the disciples. They were all martyred. And to this day, people still don't like the message that we have. And it's strange, <laughs> Dave, said, Dave, Dave Rosales said that, he goes, you will get the strangest people. He said he had one guy come up and say, why are you driving a red car? It's like a red car. Yeah, well, what color car should I drive? You ought to be driving a white car. It's like, well, why should I drive a white car? Well, because white, purity, holiness. And Dave goes, but red the blood of Jesus. <laughs> and then he goes, the guy just says, oh, yeah, okay. You get the strangest stuff going on. You know? It's going to happen no matter what. And nothing is going to stop it. Nothing is going to stop it. So they did the same to Jesus. They did it to the disciples. So they're doing it to Jeremiah. Verse 19, give heed to me, O Lord, and listen to the voice of those who contend with me. Now Jeremiah is speaking to the Lord. He's saying, hear me, Lord. Please hear me. Shall evil be repaid for good? For they have dug a pit for my life. Remember that I stood before you to speak good for them, to turn away your wrath from them. It's like, Lord, I am am sharing with them to save their very lives. But they're over there digging a pit. (laughs) <laughs> you can almost picture them digging the pit to throw him in. And he's saying, look, just repent and turn, you know, and, and you'll be saved. And they're digging the pit like, okay, you know, it's like, Lord, do something here. Therefore, deliver up their children, he says, to the famine and pour out their blood by the force of the sword. Let their wives become widows and their be raved of their children. Let their men be put to death, their young men be slain by the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard from their houses. And when you bring a troop or raiders, and he's talking about the Babylonians, suddenly upon them, for they have dug a pit to take me and hidden snares for my feet. Yet, Lord, you know 
all their counsel which is against me, to slay me, provide no atonement for their iniquity, nor blot out their sins from their sight or your sight, but let them be overthrown before you, deal thus with them in the time of your anger. Wow. How do you feel, Jeremiah? <laughs> well, let me tell you, God. <laughs> My question is, is that right? I, I don't think it's right for us today. We just smile and we pray for that God will continue his work, you know, in, in them. And hopefully take them to a place where they will understand who God is and, and know him and understand the whole principle of church government and what God has established and, and what is right before the eyes of the Lord. It is never right to <clears throat> and I'm speaking for today for us to go into a church and divide it. That's never right. To gossip, to lie, to destroy, to bring accusations. There's only one accuser, and that accuser is Satan. And believe me, he does a good job at what he was intending to do, and we don't need to help him at all in doing that. But Jeremiah's emotions, uh, Chuck calls them that, uh, what they call it in psychology, that personality that's just kind of like, whoa, Lord, it's me type of attitude, that swan, swan attitude. Uh, I can't remember the word that he uses. <clears throat> and he gets worse later on down the road. You, know. you almost re see how they call him the weeping prophet, right? I mean, he never saw a convert. Not one person came to the Lord. Not one of them heard his messages. Not one of them responded. You know, they all responded with, we hate you. We don't like you. We are going to dig a pit for you. But he still stuck with it. You know, he still stuck with it. He didn't stop. Because God rewards the faithfulness of a man in the position that he gives him. The faithfulness to fulfill that position. Let me close. God is sovereign God is above all things <coughs> before all things he is the alpha the omega the beginning the end he is the immortal he is the present he is everywhere and everyone can know him revelations 21 6 God created all things hold all things together both in heaven and earth both visible and invisible Colossians 116. God knows all things in the past, in the present, in the future. There's no limit to his knowledge, for God knows everything completely before it even happens. Ele Romans 11.33. God can do all things, accomplish all things. Nothing is too difficult for him, uh, and he orchestrates and determines everything that is going to happen in your life in my life in, in america and throughout the world whatever he wants to do in this universe he does for nothing is impossible with god jeremiah 32 god is in total control so we might as well repent and surrender to him and then watch how he does great things through us when we do that 